Okay, so we are at the stroke of 12 p.m. So we are going to jump right in and get started. Um, thanks for joining us from near or far or wherever you may be um, for our first program, which is in the Student Org Essentials series. Um, and we designed this lineup of programs to be centered around what we know uh, student organizations are thinking about in doing their operations and community engagement and member development. And so we added uh, a virtual lens to those concepts because we're in a really unique time right now um, in needing to shift many aspects of our lives, including student organizations. So um, today's topic is from surviving to thriving, um, ensuring your sustainability and success in uncertain times. My name is Brooke Olson. I work in student activities and my role is specifically to support the student org community. Um, but to chat with us about this topic today, I've invited in uh, Jen Pelletier. She is an associate director for us in student activities within the Office of Student Life. And she supports initiatives around community engagement and service and leadership development and our student org community. So she has a lot of really great insight and expertise. So we're happy to have her with us. Um, welcome, Jen. Thanks for joining. Passing it over to you. All right, thanks, Brooke. Um, and welcome everybody to um, our first summer program series. We're excited to see how these go as we move forward through the summer. Um, like Brooke said, uh, my name is Jen Pelletier. Uh, I work in student activities, have been at Ohio State for a number of years. And as I was preparing for today's session, I tried to put myself back in the shoes of a student organization leader. So when I was a college student, I was involved in different things like my hall council, um, my sorority, and the, the governing council for that sorority, as well as one of our senior honoraries. Um, I was not a student at Ohio State as an undergrad, but still very involved in our student org community. Um, and so I was trying to envision what might I have done if I had been in this kind of situation or, or what might I be thinking about if I were a student org leader experiencing some of the things that we know our student org leader and our overall community is experiencing right now. Um, so what I have tried to put together is, um, is, is some, some food for thought for today. Um, so today's session is going to feel maybe a little less tangible than our other five sessions that we have scheduled over the course of the summer. Um, those are going to dig much deeper into some, some very tactical topics related to socially distant service and recruitment and how you manage social media. Um, today we're going to say a little bit bigger picture um, as a way to introduce the overall series um, and offer some framework and, and some ways to think about, about where we are and how we navigate and get to back to a, a more thriving kind of environment. Um, and then of course we'll wrap up and we'll provide some resources um, and some tools that we think might be helpful for you this summer but also throughout the upcoming year. Um, so I wanted to set some ground rules uh, for our conversation today. Um, we are all living in a very weird, uncertain time, but we're all, you know, um, maybe having our, our own unique or different reactions to that. So as folks share ideas today, I, I welcome a diversity of, of inputs and experiences. And if, if somebody is sharing something that's not quite your experience, would love to hear your experience as, as a balance to that perspective as well. Um, nobody has all the answers, in, including me, uh, but, but each of us has something worthwhile to contribute. And so um, that is where I hope we can start some of our conversation. I've, I've got some ideas and, and I'm curious to hear what you all are, are thinking and, and how you might move forward with some of these things as well. Um, our norms for communication today, we're, we're definitely going to use the chat. Uh, and you're also welcome to, to unmute and, and share via audio as well if that's your preference. Um, video is totally optional today, so feel free to um, keep your face on the screen or enjoy a little bit of, of no screen time or, or no video time if you need that break from, from watching your face uh, for the next hour or so. And then by the end of today's session, um, what I'd like to ask of all attendees is that you can commit to at least one action. Um, there's, there's lots of good information and knowledge and we'll have some conversation and some sharing, but what do we do with all of that? I want you to be thinking about as we, as we go through this time together, um, what is maybe one action that you can do following the session? And, and don't worry, I will, of course, remind you of this at the end and, and ask you to share a little bit about that. 
Um, but first, I uh, want to hear a little bit about who you are and why you're here. Um, so we're going to open up our first poll here. Um, so if you could just respond to uh, what role do you hold in your student organization? Or is everyone seeing the poll? Okay, I'm seeing responses, so you must be. Um, your options are president, treasurer, maybe part of the leadership team or executive board, a committee chairperson, general member, faculty or staff advisor, um, or other. Um, we've got a secretary in the room. Thanks for sharing that. I um, want to give you maybe just a few more seconds. We've still got some folks who haven't responded, um, but I appreciate their responses here just so we get a sense of, of who's with us today. It's really helpful. Got a lot of faculty and staff advisors. I love that. Got a couple secretaries here as well. Very good. Um, so let me share these results so that everyone can see sort of our breakdown today. Um, lots of colleagues in the room, so um, thank you colleagues for, for being here. A few presidents in the room, so I'm glad you all can be here today as well. Um, as um, just as a, a reminder, maybe we are going to we're recording the session and we'll post it to the website so um, folks can access this later today as well. Um, I'm also curious just right off the bat, what are you hoping to gain or learn today? So if you want to drop that in the chat or if you want to unmute and share via audio, just even a quick like hoping to learn this one thing or have questions about maybe just curious what the heck this thing is. Um, I'm open to, to whatever you might be be interested or hoping to learn or gain today. So we'll take just a second. Again, feel free to drop that in the chat or unmute yourself to, to just share a couple ideas as we get started here. I'll go ahead and speak. Um, I'm from the Marion campus and I advise um, CAB or Campus Activities Board and USG. I'm hoping to gain some ways to continue to motivate my student groups to be um, active and productive, even though I know the fall semester will probably not look like it has looked in the past. So I'm trying to, to gain some skills and how to keep them to still stay motivated. Yep, thanks Karen, thanks for sharing that. I agree, motivation is, is a big topic that's definitely on my mind. I'm guessing that's that's pretty common for, for other groups as well. I'm seeing some things in the chat about how to transfer our organization's mission and values to more of a digital platform, um, learning about resources that might be available, how do we keep members involved, inspired, maybe similar to that kind of motivation idea as well, and stay connected over the summer. I know for a lot of orgs, summer can be a downtime, um, but this summer, maybe we don't spend that downtime. Maybe we are a little bit more focused on our operations. Um, so yeah, absolutely. How do we, how do we encourage student organization growth and, and success despite our, our current situation? All of those things are, are, are great. I'm really glad to see that. Um, so um, over, the, over the past couple months, um, our student org staff has had some conversations and our, our broader student activities team has had some conversations about the value of a co-curricular experience, including student orgs, major events, community engagement, leadership workshops, all those things that we might consider a regular and an essential part of our campus life. And while there are a number of different specific purposes and goals across these experiences, um, there are also a few things that are consistent. And one that especially stands out to me is this idea of community, um, that meaningful engagement is rooted in community, not necessarily our physical spaces. Although we've come to rely on those spaces, um, we, can, we can still foster and pursue these ideas around community um, regardless of the environment that we're in. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about our student organization community. At the end of autumn semester, we had um, nearly 1,500 active student orgs on the Columbus campus, um, but with an average org size of, of 28 members. So that, that total number of organizations may seem overwhelming, but 28 members is really reasonable. So if you're in an average organization, you could get to know all the other members and probably a fun fact about them as well. Um, so I like to think not about this huge, massive group of nearly 1,500 student orgs, but I prefer to think about this nearly 1,500 unique micro communities 
that exist on our campus. Students who have come together around some shared interests and to give of their time to do something that matters to them. Um, and as student org leaders, you provide an incredibly important experience for your fellow students. And so we wanna help you think about how you can be successful in that. Um, so one, one way to maybe start some, some additional discussion here is, is think about why you joined your student organization in the first place. So we'll pause for a quick moment here. Again, just drop that in the chat um, or, or unmute and, and share just a quick thought about why'd you join your organization in the first place? While we're waiting for those responses to come in, um, I often hear reasons like to meet other people who like the same stuff that I like. Or when we're, when we're talking with brand new organizations who are just getting started, I often hear, well, I know something, I've learned something, I've figured something out, and I wanna share that with other students who may also need it. Yeah, right, to create a safe space for women in STEM. Um, and, and Heather, I'm guessing that you probably also identify as a woman in STEM. Um, now maybe part of it was like the free t-shirt or that promo item at the involvement fair, uh, but I would, I would probably guess that it's mostly about the people. Um, the people who become part of your community. Community is at the core of our student org experience and this is the stuff that gives meaning to our lives. Yeah, absolutely, Michaela. Um, finding a community of students with similar interests, access to arts education, learning about cultures other than my own, and um, continuing something that you enjoyed engaging with, like community service from, from high school, from previous experiences. Um, I'm an incoming president, was instrumental in my transition to grad school. school. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, right, finding an organization like Sustained Dialogue who cares about social justice, um, areas for growth, both individually and on a larger scale. I love all of these reasons. Thank you all for, for sharing those. Um, I think one of the ways that we typically build community is through our meetings, our programs, our fundraisers, our conferences, our service projects, our social hangouts, and, and all those other things. Um, we need to think now about how we can achieve those same outcomes just through different methods. Um, it's, this, is, this is a whole new world, uh, and we need to think a little bit differently. So, so that's, where, that's where I want us to head. Um, here are a few things that are characterizing my life and my work right now, and, and maybe you can relate to some of these things. Um, there's a huge amount of uncertainty. Uh, there's, there's sort of this hurry up and wait with the changes, I think. Um, we see lots of decisions being made, and then right now I feel like we're waiting on the next decision to be made. So things are fast, and then there's waiting. Um, it, it, Brooke and I have talked a lot, especially lately, about the multiple contingency plans. Well, we've got to plan A if we do this, and B if we do this, and C if we do that. Um, everything is turned virtual, whether that is learning, or working, or happy hours with friends. Um, what I do appreciate, one thing I do appreciate about our new context is that it seems to have normalized really regular conversations about our well-being, whether that is related to physical, mental, emotional, nutritional, social, like, wellness is now a regular part of our conversation. I don't think that's too bad. Um, what are some other things? I'm curious if, if anyone, again, would like to unmute or add to the chat. What are some other ways that you might describe this new context or what you're seeing, what you're experiencing? Or if some of the things that are already on the screen um, are resonating with you, feel free to just say ditto that. Um, but yeah, I agree. There's some really interesting opportunities for creative problem solving. Thanks for adding that in. That's a great addition. Yeah, I just wanted to join in real quick and say Please. I've seen um, lots of people taking on new challenges and, and using this time instead of laying low to, to push themselves and try to go for goals that they didn't go for in the past. Yeah, good. Um, and that's really encouraging that we're, we're using this time to maybe motivate ourselves in different ways or to go after things that we might not have otherwise. I really appreciate that. Thanks for sharing. Um, regardless, and, and there's lots of, lots of ways that we might describe this new context, but this is a new adventure for all of us. And we may feel like we are building the bridge as we walk on it, um, but, but we can figure this out. We can do this. 
Um, one of the steady parts of our bridge, especially in student org land, is our student org success framework. This is a shameless plug, but I think it's helpful. Um, the, this is the, the 19 outcomes that, that our team have developed for your student organizations across three really key areas, membership development, organization operations, and community engagement. These are the things that we think will help student organizations pursue success. These outcomes can be used to help you evaluate your current operations, to inform your annual goals, to connect with campus resources. Um, even in our new context, these general outcomes will continue to be relevant. They're gonna look differently than before, um, and our student org team is working to adapt some of our resources and some of our descriptions so that it's even more clear how these types of outcomes will show up in our, our virtual or hybrid environments. Um, but the overall structure here, our focus on our people, our operations, and how we stay connected with community is gonna be consistent um, no, matter, no matter how we move forward. Um, and so some of our structures work, but we know that some of our structures are not going to work. Um, and with that in mind, our student org team realized we needed to do something to support our student organization community and help you find ways to be successful in this new context. And so that is part of the reason we've created this programming series. Um, for the past two months, I would say that maybe we've been more in survival mode. Um, and again, maybe you can relate. Uh, looking ahead, we have the opportunity to be more proactive, more thoughtful, more intentional, to get to or get back to a place where we're thriving. Um, and I hope, I, 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 would, I would guess that we hope it might be as simple as this. We're going to move from survival mode to thriving mode. Um, but in reality, it's probably going to look a little bit more like this. Um, so choosing to re-envision one part of your organization, like a program or a retreat or a process, can be really exciting and creative. And I think, you know, this is an opportunity for creative problem solving. We saw that in the chat. Having to re-envision every part of your organization, every program, every retreat, every process can be daunting. It may feel uncomfortable. It may feel overwhelming. You may think at some points, why am I bothering with this? And that's totally, totally normal. Um, so what I'd like to do is kind of shift a little bit and share a framework that I regularly refer to to think through challenges and to really get to the heart of what matters. And some of you may be familiar with this already, um, but it's called the Golden Circle. Um, and our friend Simon Sinek writes about this in his book, Start With Why. Uh, or there's a link on the bottom of the screen that you can use to check out his TED Talk for a, a super quick overview of this concept. Um, but the, the heart of the golden circle is that we are more effective in our communications and to motivate and move other people when we order um, our communications in a specific way, from the inside to the outside of the circle, rather than from the outside to the inside of the circle. Um, so our why is really our purpose, um, why we've come together, um, th the reason you get up in the morning, and that is the thing that, that is unchanged, right? That purpose needs to drive us more than ever right now. Um, as, as an organization, as a student organization, this could be a really interesting exercise to have a conversation with your leadership team or your entire membership about what's the real purpose of our organization, why did they join? Kind of back to that same reflection question we all just answered, why did you join your org in the first place? Really getting back to that organizational and, and personal why, because hopefully that stuff is still the same. I'm gonna skip to the end. The what um, could be different or the same, right? Our outputs and results can still be achieved. We can still do these programs and maybe we wanna keep some of them Maybe we want to change some of the, the programs or experiences we have for our student orgs and, and make those different. The how, that slice in the middle, is, is where I think our biggest changes are going to come. This is where our processes are going to need to shift to virtual or hybrid methods, um, maybe even a variety of methods, right? Because what works well for a meeting is different than what works for a fundraiser, is different than what works for a new member training workshop. So we may need to think about a lot of different hows um, as we move forward. So one example of this, um, this golden circle um, is how our student org team 
approached our um, our, our trainings for spring semester. We shifted president, treasurer, and advisor trainings from in-person sessions to Zoom sessions in March and April. Our why and our what were pretty much the same, right? Our why is we needed to share information and, and help prepare leaders and advisors to, to capably guide their organizations. Our what is a PowerPoint slide of lecture and discussion. Um, but the how took some getting used to. We had now a double registration process. We needed to manage a chat instead of just raised hands. Um, we used virtual polls. Uh, we, we did sign-ins differently, like all, all of these kinds of things. So um, I want you to also think about like, what is that thing and the how that you need to change in your organization? So um, our next discussion will be about your how. So meetings are pretty straightforward to adapt. Um, and we've got a session later this summer about how to do virtual meetings really well. So I don't want to, I don't want to steal their thunder and don't want to spend too much time on that today, but I'm curious to hear about those more complex or uncertain areas of your student organization. Um, so, so feel free again, like let's drop it in the chat or, or unmute yourself, but I'm curious to hear an example of what is one thing in your organization that you know you need to change the how but you haven't, you haven't done it yet. You haven't figured out how to do that how differently yet. Who's got, who's got an idea or an example to share? Any examples about maybe an, an operations element, something that you regularly do with and for your members? I see you're unmuted, Danny, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick thing. Um, I, I think the how with social justice has always been difficult for us. Like, how do we, how do we get people to see the impact that a positive social justice campaign or even just like a volunteer opportunity can have? if they're not actively, you know, volunteering with us and we can't um, relate to them face to face. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. Um, and if I can like broaden that out, I agree with you, social justice kind of work is, is part of that category of stuff that it's a, it feels essential to be face to face. Right? It feels essential to have a person-to-person -person connection. That's sort of the, the nature and the intent of that work is to, is to impact humans in a really positive way. Um, so again, shameless plug, in, in two weeks, we're going to be gathered uh, in the same environment to, to talk a little bit about socially distant service. And I think there will be some good conversations there about, about how, we, how we incorporate community voice and how we develop and maintain partnerships and relationships, even in a virtual space. Um, so, so I think that could be one, but I agree with you, Danny, there's, there's a lot of how to be figured out, especially in those, in those more relational oriented types of experiences. Um, seeing a couple things in the chat box, how to make meetings more useful beyond simple updates. I agree with that. Like how do we do professional development, team building, social activities? Um, how can we reach out to underserved communities digitally whose demographics tend not to have access to those resources needed for engagement? Absolutely, right? We're talking about equity and access kinds of things. If we're moving to a virtual environment and people don't have virtual tools, um, we've, got, we've got, you know, baseline barriers that we need to, that we need to figure out before we can even figure out the, the intent of that experience or, or the connection of that experience. Absolutely, good, good questions, good points. Um, I think the this is where this is where the work is going to be, right? Um, there's there's no one simple only answer for all of these how kinds of things. Um, but I, I hope maybe it feels somewhat good that we're not the only ones thinking about this, right? That um, as as we're as we're trying to navigate uh, some of these changes. We're not the only organization thinking about how do we connect with communities? How do we connect with folks who may have inadequate access to technologies? How do we do things that are, that are social and relational, relationship oriented, um, like, like team building or social events when, when we're in this new environment? 
Um, and I think, um, Kidron, thanks for that, that, that latest comment in the chat. Um, how, do, how do we do this knowing that everything is virtual? Um, and so when every part of our life is virtual, that can feel really tiring. Um, and it can, it can definitely wear us out. And so if I have to do class virtually, and if I have to do some work things virtually, maybe I'm going to be a little less motivated to do my voluntary student organization involvement virtually. Maybe I'm going to feel a little bit less engaged in that space. So, um, so yeah, that's a, it's a really great point about just sort of managing people's energy level and, and tiredness in general. Um, so again, um, I have no answers for you directly, but I do have more resources and, and, I, and I do, we can help you kind of make connections with one another um, and help coach and consult with you about how to figure these things out um, more on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, another kind of concept that I, I wanna talk a little bit about is our difference is the difference between knowing something and, and doing something um, and just because we know things are different and that we need to do things different doesn't mean that we're going to actually act differently um, so so on the screen you can see uh, our cartoon of, of two individuals at a chalkboard and there's some you know math equations on the left and some math equations on the right and then the middle is written then a miracle occurs um, and on the bottom it reads, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. Um, absolutely, right? So, so we've, got some, we've got some ideas and we have a, a sense of what we hope it will be and there's just sort of this guess that, oh, a miracle will happen and we'll just figure it all out. Um, it, but this isn't, this isn't necessarily unique to, uh, to our new situation. Maybe you've seen this kind of phenomenon in your organization before. Um, for example, maybe you have clearly outlined your membership expectations. Members seem to understand them, and yet some members don't fulfill their obligations. We know it, but we don't act it. What the heck, right? Um, so you can set up all the right processes. You can do the right how. And those processes can be aligned with your core purpose. They can be, you know, really closely centered on the why. And they can be directed at getting the results you want at your what. And things still may not go the way you intended. I know it was a really inspirational talk today, right? Um, I think what I want to affirm for us is that um, there's no miracle in the middle. Um, this was the case in our old normal this will be the case in our new normal with the added bonus of all the other things that are continuing to evolve around us. Um, I think I just want to normalize that this is going to be hard. Like getting, getting people to move from knowing something, knowing that we need to change, and actually doing that change is hard um, because change is hard, especially when we're in environments where we don't feel like we have control over the changes that we are experiencing. Um, so one thing that, um, that I am trying to, to take in this approach is to consider as we think about our hows, is to consider both the logistics and the emotions that are involved, right? Um, as leaders of our student organizations, we may find ourselves really focused on, well, I'll, I'll get the right Zoom link and I'll use breakout rooms and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll use GroupMe and Slack and we'll use all these tools and I've got all the logistics figured out and check, 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 check all the boxes. Um, but if we're not considering people's emotions and how they're feeling um, and, 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 and how we're navigating this, not on a to-do list, but on a, a feel list, um, then, we're, then we're missing something. So I wanted to share um, this piece of, of artwork. Um, an artist that I follow on Instagram, Brian Andreas, recently posted this drawing. Um, and it reads, it's funny how letting go takes actual letting go and not just talking with everyone you know about how letting go is a process. Um, it made me think about some of the things that we've been forced to let go of. Uh, our plans for the entire month of April, perhaps. Uh, related to this, my, uh, one of my professors in grad school shared that you have to acknowledge the loss of something before you can fully commit to the new reality. 
in, in that case, he was talking about choosing a major, choosing a career. And so, for example, by, by choosing to be an English major, you won't be a neuroscience pre-med major. And how you have to let go of that possibility of becoming a doctor so that you can fully pursue the possibility of becoming a writer. Uh, but even in that situation, don't worry, like you can still watch Grey's Anatomy for fun. So on our way towards thriving, um, we need to acknowledge the loss of some things um, and, and acknowledge that that is hard and the emotions that go along with it. Um, it's, it's hard, but it's important and it's restoring work that we can do. And by allowing time for the emotions of letting go, we open ourselves up to the emotions of possibility. So this is where I want to move next. Um, so for, for our next discussion, um, I want you to think about two things. One thing that your organization will not do or will not be able to do, and how do you think people will feel about that? And then one thing that your organization will be able to do instead. And, and how do you think people will feel about that? So I know this is maybe a little bit more introspective. I wanna, I wanna give you a minute or two to, to think about what this could be. So again, feel free to, to unmute yourself, feel free to drop some ideas in the chat box, but what is one thing that your organization will not do and how will people feel? But then what is one thing that your organization will be able to do instead? And how do you think people will feel about that? Give folks a, a minute or so to, to drop some ideas in the chat box. Feel free to, to enter one or the other. You don't necessarily need to respond to both or respond to both at the same time. So um, curious to hear what's on your mind about this. Letting go as well as possibilities. All right, got a comment in the chat that reads, we may not be able to engage hands-on with service projects, but we can embark on the new journey of online service projects and new possibilities there. Absolutely, I think that's a, a great shift. Um, and in, in a couple weeks, our colleague AJ Johnson has, has got some additional guidance on how we do socially distant or virtual service projects. So that's a good kind of substitution there. Um, Let's see, another comment, due to the arising flexibility, we want to stay away from strict requirements and structure. I get that. Uh, people may see this as unprofessional. However, we want to constantly adapt and try out new ideas given by new members. We hope this will, people, will show people how fast an impact can hit. I think that that idea of being really nimble and really adaptable um, is going to be incredibly helpful in this new context moving forward. I, I agree with that a lot, Danny. Um, and I think it's, it's helpful for you to be thinking about um, people are going to have an initial maybe reaction that, hey, this isn't how we operate. I, I'm not sure I like it. Um, but maybe especially for newer members joining your organization, they're going to see the opportunity to make a contribution really quickly. To, to shape the future of this organization really quickly. And that may be differently motivating um, and really helpful. Um, so Michaela is sharing what we will not be able to do, travel internationally for exchange trips and service work. Yep, we definitely feel you on that. Um, our, our Buckeye Serve Alternative Breaks program is having some conversations about how do we do a program that's all about travel. Um, but what we can do from Michaela still is focus on our work domestically, offering creative outlets, during time of, of coping and coped, absolutely. Um, so, so, and I think that that creativity can, can feel really motivating as well. We heard that, that earlier, right? Like what, what characterizes our new context, our current context is that it's an opportunity for creative problem solving. Um, and again, I think this is a good example of, well, we can't exactly do this, so we're gonna try to do this instead, almost like a one-to-one -one swap. Um, so it, it sort of fills a gap um, 
in a different way. Um, Karen, from a staff perspective for Campus Activities Board, will probably not be able to do large in-person events um, at the beginning of the year, absolutely. Um, I think we've seen that on the Columbus campus as well with our Ohio Union Activities Board and some of their programming. Um, some of the things that they had scheduled towards the end of spring semester, they weren't able to bring those artists to campus in person. Um, but a couple of them, they were able to translate to a virtual environment and, and do some, some Q&A with, uh, with, with Kevin Love and, and, and have him still sort of be present um, and do a, a smaller breakout room with, with students who were, were working on mental health issues and topics that, that connected with part of Kevin's message. So um, yeah, we're, we're gonna miss those, those big in-person concerts and events and other things like that. Um, won't be able to host um, the type of programming our students are used to, but most students will understand. I think that's a great point, Kidron. Yeah, um, people are gonna get it. They're, they're gonna understand why we can't do it. They're gonna be sad, maybe. They're gonna feel like something is missing, but it's not because you all aren't doing your job. Um, In-person seminars are beneficial from Heather, but virtual seminars might be easier to organize. Agree, yeah, I think um, that's something that, that Brooke and I have talked a little bit about as we've been coordinating this, this summer program series is that um, we were able to pull it together really quickly. Uh, and, and no matter where our presenters are, we, we've got access to them. So um, we might be able to reach a, a larger audience this summer than we might have otherwise. Um, so yeah, instead of some of those big sessions, maybe we do more smaller social sessions, right? Instead of one big thing, maybe we're doing multiple smaller things. Um, Jason's comment, if, if club fairs are canceled during orientation, um, organizations will no longer be seen or, or judged as just reflective of the person that's staffing that table or that booth at that first encounter. Um, so the first impression could be reframed. It could be more inclusive, the entire organization, um, something more than just one person. I think that's a really great reframing, Jason. Thanks for sharing that. Um, be able to, to engage more with populations of students who previously involved, avoided involvement like the plague. I appreciate your, um, your speaking reality and truth there, Kidron. Um, and, and hope that maybe we can uncover why students were choosing not to get involved and, and, and maybe customize our programming to fit that population better. I think that's a great um, opportunity to do some creative thinking, right? Why would students have not joined us in the past? Um, and how can we connect with them differently? in the future. Um, Michaela, additional comment here, there's, there's more room for collaboration between orgs who may never have worked together. I agree with that. Um, whether that's within your campus community or using, you know, community partners that are, that are outside of the university as well. Um, I, I agree. I think some of this use of a virtual space kind of um, flattens our, our access to people, right? We're, we're all navigating virtual spaces in the same way. We all show up in the exact same sized video box here. And so um, maybe it does make it feel a little easier um, to collaborate and, and to, work, to work with other folks as well. I really appreciate the sharing. These ideas are super helpful. Um, and I, I'm nodding along as I'm, as I'm reading your chats. Um, so thank you, thank you for, for sharing these, these ideas. Um, the one thing that I do want to just make sure we're thinking about, and, and, I, and I definitely saw this as, a, as a, a thread in the chat and in what was shared, is as we think about these changes, we, we want to make sure that we're still thinking about how are people feeling, right? How are they going to react to this? Um, who's going to be happy and what about? Who's going to be disappointed and why? And, and, if, and how can we address that? There may be some disappointments that we're not going to be able to address because if we can't have a, a campus-wide concert, then, then people are gonna be disappointed. There's not a lot we can do about that. Um, but for the, for the things that we can, for the things where we, where we might be able to, um, to offer some sort of emotional support or some sort of substitution, uh, let's, let's keep our eyes focused there. All right, um, so I've done a fair amount of talking. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna start to, to maybe wrap us up here a little bit um, and recap some of the some of the key ideas that I, that I tried to share today that um, at the heart our student organizations build community on our campus and and the reason that we joined our organizations are are about people and and connecting with people in some way 
that we are in a wildly uncertain time and that has a lot of different characteristics to it. Um, some that are challenging and, and some that are opportunities. And that the, the direct line from surviving mode to thriving isn't a straight line, but rather more of a squiggle. And it's going to take um, some, some work and some effort to get to one, from one to the other. That as we reaffirm our, our why and our what, we need to really shift our attention to our how. That's where our work is going to be, not on why we've come together, not on, on what we intend to do necessarily, but how we go about doing it. And, and spending our time there is going to be really important um, because there's, there's no miracle in the middle. Um, this is going to take a fair amount of effort, and we are going to need to rely on one another as resources. Uh, and as we go through this process, acknowledging the emotions involved with, with letting go, but also focusing on the emotions involved in, in those possibilities that are now available to us. Um, all of these things together can kind of set a framework uh, for us to be thinking about how will we pursue success in this upcoming semester, in this upcoming year, um, and, and use that as the groundwork for what comes after that even. I wanted to share um, a few resources courtesy of our student activities and student organizations team um, that, that you can take advantage of right now. Um, so first is our student org success framework. I mentioned this towards the beginning. Um, all of these outcomes still apply. It's just going to look differently. Um, Related to this, our student org success coaches and our student organization staff, um, we can consult with you and, and we can chat with you specifically about what's going on in your organization, what are some possible strategies you might consider using. Um, our staff are available over the summer and our student coaches will be back in the fall to work with you one-on-one -on -one as well. Um, additional resources, um, this series continues. Today is the kickoff, and so um, our summer program series is continuing with five more topics between now and the end of July. Um, all of these are, are open to, to anyone, and so you're welcome to register. There's a link on the bottom of the screen there to register for any future sessions if you haven't already. Uh, we're also recording these sessions, and so we will post the recording and the transcript to that same website um, so that if you wanted to, um, to come back or to um, share with somebody else that, that these will be available. Um, also wanted to share some student life resources around how to stay social and stay connected to your community, especially important during this time is to maintain those connections to community. So even though we're social or physical distancing, we still have an opportunity to, to be social with one another. And I'll share the link for the Student Life blog at the end of, at the, end of the presentation, but it's medium.com slash at studentlifeosu, uh, where you can view some additional resources and recommendations that the Office of Student Life has to share. All right. Um, so, oh, and Brooke has put it in the chat. Thank you, Brooke. Appreciate that. Um, that's uh, information about how to get connected with coaching uh, specifically. There's a request form on the website. Um, so our final poll question here, just wanted to, to check in and, and see, did you get what you were hoping for today? Um, so I'll go ahead and launch this. Um, yes, definitely, mostly. Maybe not what you expected, but still some useful ideas. Not so much. Maybe it was interesting, but not totally sure what to do with it. Or no, not at all. You've still got questions. And, and wherever you might be on this is, is totally fine. We'll use this as, as good feedback and good input for what we continue to develop for our student orgs. Um, see that many of you have, have submitted. So we'll give just a, a few more seconds, and then I'll, I'll show the results here. I appreciate the input on this. All right, we'll share the results here. So, um, so yeah, so some sort of combination between yes, feeling good and mostly useful, maybe not what you were totally expecting, but, but still usable. I feel great about, about both of those. So um, thanks for that. Thanks for that quick input there. That's really helpful to know. Um, 
like I mentioned at the beginning, you knew it was coming. I hope you've been thinking about it. Um, I want you to consider one action you will take as a result of today's conversation. So I've offered some suggestions, in, including a shameless plug to Google Student Org Success Framework. Um, but again, this is maybe one final, one final opportunity to uh, share in the chat or to unmute your audio. But I'm curious to, to hear a little bit about like, what is that, that one action, that, that next step that, that you'll take as it relates to the success and, and the thriving for your student organization? Who's, who's got some examples they're willing to share? I'll some of go. these could, oh yeah, please. Sorry, um, I think this really inspired me to, um, as an advisor, really encourage our students to meet more regularly. I know with summer sessions starting sometimes and, and us still waiting to know what's gonna happen in the fall, it feels like, well, we'll just, we'll just put off that meeting. But I think there's a lot of really good steps that if we could take now is gonna help um, everything that happens in the fall. So that's, that's something that I would really want to do right away. Yeah, Karen, thanks for sharing that. I think it's a great point. Um, and one that um, even with our student organization team, we, we typically don't offer program programming during the summer um, because we know that a lot of student organizations may see that as a downtime where they kind of take, take the summer off. Um, but I think this summer may be even more important to stay connected and, and schedule some meetings and, and start making plans. Um, I'm seeing a couple things in chat about doing some reflecting, setting some goals, continuing to seek out those, those areas of inspiration or, or resources, especially for general body members. Um, I agree with that focus on your general members. Um, the, the leadership team may feel more connected because you have a specific role and a specific thing to do. Um, your, your general members may not be feeling that sense of purpose. So staying in contact uh, and communication with them may, may go a long way, especially towards your member retention over this next year. Um, Allison, I appreciate you um, leaning into my shameless plug to uh, check out the success framework um, and schedule a meeting with your leadership team um, so that you can start making those plans for the summer and the fall. Social media presence, virtual events, all of those things are great things to be thinking about. I appreciate that. Um, any, additional, any additional ideas or, or action steps that folks want to share at this point? Okay. Well, I appreciate the, the examples um, that you all contributed there. That's, that's helpful to hear sort of where your head is as far as what's coming next. Um, so this is, this is the conclusion of our session for today, but certainly not the end of our conversation. So um, on the screen here, I've, I've listed my email address as well as our student activities and student orgs general email account. Um, also uh, the student life, email address that's a, a great place to find more campus-wide resources and information as well as a link to our student life um, staying social while social distancing blog again that medium.com slash at student life osu um, so brooke and i are more than happy uh, to stick around. We've still got some time left in this hour. Um, we are more than happy to stick around and, and maybe chat one-on-one -on -one about how to connect with any of these resources or, or other questions that you might have. But, but that's the end of our formal program for today. So if you have other things that you need to get to, um, you're welcome to, to log off uh, with our thanks for joining us today. Uh, and, and please don't hesitate to reach out and uh, we'd be happy to connect with you as you continue making plans for, for this upcoming year, however we might be able to. So thanks everybody for attending. Yeah, thanks for joining. Appreciate you taking the time out of your day yeah. to talk with us about these goals that you might be having and setting up. So please do reach out, um, utilize those links. The request form is in the chat. So if you scroll back a little bit and wanna go right to that request form and set up a scheduled time to chat with us, we can certainly do that too. Um, but this isn't the last time we'll have these conversations. So um, until next time we see you, maybe in a couple weeks or in whenever we schedule a, an individual chat with you too. So thanks, have a good one.